Good morning. Thank you so much for coming out at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, I mean, I wouldn't have, but uh, <laughs> I'm glad you have. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's good to see you all. Um, so when I was asked to consider this idea of truth, um, you know, it's something that I've actually thought about for many, many years. And um, I always revert to my native language of Arabic. And so here we have the translation of truth, which translates to hakika. And um, hakika means reality or what is real. We don't actually have a word for truth in Arabic, so it does translate to reality. And um, I decided to divide the talk into four segments, and reality is actually segment number one. So if we could go to the next slide, please. And the next. <laughs> So I uh, wanted to confront you with these images that you all know very well. We know the story behind them. And I think what makes them so horrific to us is not just the image itself, but what we imagine the story to be. And so we all find ourselves creating our own version of the truth when it comes to these images. The reality is probably worse um, than anything that we could imagine. But again, it's this idea of what the image confronts us with and what we think of as the truth. And so um, Susan Sontag says the camera itself is a predatory weapon, right? So violence, it seems, is inherent to the photograph born out of the language of the medium itself. So when you consider the idea of um, shooting an image, that word to shoot in and of itself conjures violence, right? And so when we think of the image and what it is offering us in terms of truth, this is, um, this is something that I just want you to sit with for one second uh, before we move on. And we, we, we see that in war photography uh, all the time. And so uh, often, more often than not, what is being depicted is, um, is very violent and it's very sensationalized. Um, so, and this is a little difficult, so my apologies for depressing you early in the morning, but uh, one thing that I want you to, to remember is, for example, the horrific beheadings um, that we witnessed at the hands of ISIS. We witnessed those images, we, we saw those videos, we saw the footage, um, but as horrific as these events were, they were not the event itself. They were a depiction of the event, right? So I, again, I want you to consider what truth is in that manner. So uh, if we go on to the next slide, um, here we have images by Fernando Botero depicting the atrocities of uh, the Abu Ghraib prison that we just saw. Um, and what we see here is truths twice removed, right? So we have two steps. Um, but, but if we look at Botero's work, the expression of the depicted is actually very powerful. And what we end up feeling is a different kind of truth altogether. So to me, this is more powerful of an image than what we just saw. We saw a documentation of the atrocities. This is truth at a different level for me. And therein lies the power of what we as artists do. So if we go on to the next slide, um, this is a specific event that is relevant to my work, uh, April 19th, 1990. I was not yet 12, uh, almost, uh, and I remember seeing footage of this event on the television later that night, and I was living in Beirut at the time. This was a school bus that had a rifle-fired grenade to the gas tank. 
The bus exploded immediately. The death toll later rose to 17, 17 children that were my age. And I kept thinking, watching the footage, that, you know, this could have been me. And it really, really resonated. Um, and so my depiction of, um, of the school bus, which I've uh, depicted in various forms, but I'm choosing to show you this one, is of the bus itself. Years later, I went back to the archives uh, of one of Lebanon's biggest newspapers, and I bought the copyrights for these images. And um, it was 21 years later after the event, and I was amazed at how um, accurate my memory of the event was. It was like I had seen it yesterday. And so I recreated the bus here, except it was on my own terms. And what you see here is the bus without any children in it. And so I am recreating the event, but on my own terms. And so with uh, respect to war imagery, I think what gives us, um, uh, the artists, tremendous power when we are tackling hard subjects like that is control, because we control the narrative. So when I recreate these scenes, I'm recreating them on my own terms. Now, um, not, to, uh, not to dismiss uh, the children at all who are, um, if we can go to the next slide, um, that the child survivor uh, is, uh, is something that is always on my mind. And so uh, this is part of the series uh, Warheads, and it's a double entendre, uh, Warhead being weapons and Warhead being someone with war on the mind. And, um, you know, children, survivors of war, something very dear to my heart, um, me being one of them, and um, the fact that this continues to happen many years later uh, is something that always uh, comes to mind. And so these images are actually taken of passport photos of my brother and I, in which I recreate uh, these children and pay homage to them. Um, next slide, please. And next slide, please. Segment number two in discussing truth is, as a painter, I have to address the physicality of paint. And so I want to talk about the integrity of the mark and the presence of the mark. Next slide. So I, this is hard, a little hard to see, but if you're not familiar with the work of um, Kazuo Shiraga, I would h highly recommend that you uh, spend time looking up uh, the Gutai painter's work, which has been described not just only as painting, but as sculpture as well, because they have so much relief and so much presence. And so when you are considering a painting um, with this much presence, I mean, it has physical presence, not just flat 2D um, surface. Um, and so it becomes its own truth. So what do I mean by that? If we can go to the next slide, please. This is my depiction of the explosion of uh, the Beirut port in 2020. And um, you see many things happening in the image. We have uh, the symbols of the crows uh, or the, the um, vertebra. Uh, to symbolize death, the shards of glass, uh, we have the icon of the smoke, all of these images that we saw from the explosion. And then we have the mark. The mark, the red, very obvious mark that drips. Now, that mark is nothing else but paint. It's a big splash of paint, right? And so, this is what I want you to contemplate. I mean, the, the um, British philosopher Edward Burke um, was trying to make a point where he said that even a terrifyingly sublime image of violence is merely an image, right? So when we consider that in the context of painting, 
even though these paintings are depicting the horrors of humanity um, in a manner that attempts at the sublime, it can never ever replace the event. So I'm showing you these events, uh, these, these paintings of war, but I am not trying to illustrate the war, right? The best that I can do, the best that I can hope for is that the painting itself becomes truth. It starts and ends. The experience starts and ends within the painting. And so when you consider a mark, when we're dealing with mark making as painters, and for, do we have any painters in the audience? Okay, great. So, so here's what I want you to think. What is an honest mark? What is a truthful mark? When you are making what I would call a true mark, you must channel something that is so guttural, so instinctive, so unspoken, that when you lay it down on the canvas, it becomes the truth. And so what you are inviting the viewer to experience is, sure, I mean, peripherally, I'm talking all about my childhood and, and my experience in the war, and if we can move on to the next slide, um, and, and all of that, right? But what I'm inviting you to experience is something that starts and ends with the painting. That becomes the truth in and of itself. So when you are standing there, you are seeing the marks. You are seeing the marks reconciled with the form, with the symbol, and it becomes its own thing. And that is the best we can hope for as painters at any given time. Um, next slide, please. And the next slide, please. I'm just showing you a bunch of uh, work here. So <laughs> the mark shapes the truth, in my opinion. It dictates the experience that the viewer has. The mark can be flesh or flat, and it carves out a presence on the surface. The mark is a very powerful thing. So next time you're looking at painting, consider that. And consider why some, some uh, painters use thick marks versus thin marks, right? Um, the painter uh, Zoe Frank talks about uh, whether you are, when painting people, are you a flesh painter or are you a skin painter? And I love that idea, right? So when considering paint, are we considering flesh or flat? Next slide, please. Segment number three is on beauty. And next slide. And so here we can scroll. This is Beirut. Um, to me, Beirut is, um, you know, this, this very layered, scarred city. Truth, by the way, to me, has always been synonymous with beauty. And so um, when I was asked to talk about truth, I, um, I just couldn't separate it from the idea of beauty. And beauty is, has so much honesty to me, so it's not the traditional idea of beauty. And so this, to me, this is beautiful. Um, Beirut doesn't hide its flaws. It doesn't pretend. It just is. Um, its flaws amplify its beautiful parts. And uh, I think that the Lebanese find themselves addicted to this dichotomy of place, of sentiments, and of being. The city is seductive and toxic at once. And one of the paint that I use is um, micaceous oxide, which is this shimmery, like, um, gray, you know, it looks like eyeshadow. Um, and so, but it's a very toxic paint. And so I always think it's kind of like Beirut. It's uh, sexy and toxic at the same time. Um, and so it makes sense. And that's where you reconcile concept with technique. So at every step of the way, as artists, we have to consider the marriage of the two. So 
Um, I don't know how well you can see this, but this is after the explosion in uh, Beirut. One of the old restored homes had painted um, in, on the inside a mural of um, Khalil Jibran, who is the writer of The Prophet, the author of The Prophet. And there was drone footage of this beautiful image um, of uh, this exposed um, mural. And that's what I mean by just constantly, Beirut constantly revealing these moments um, within itself. And so there's also this idea of this in-betweenness, this ephemeral nature of the city, um, as I will talk in part four about this, um, this being there and not being there at the same time that Beirut does so well. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, to quote Boris Groys in his essay um, in the book, Art Writing in Crisis, which I highly recommend, um, the contemporary warrior, in this case, the contemporary warrior is the artist or the painter. So you are all as creatives, contemporary warriors shows us precisely the hidden ugliness, the image of our own suspicion, of our own angst, and precisely because of that, we feel ourselves immediately compelled to recognize these images as being true. And so, in the case of the Lebanese war survivor represented here in the form of a moribund, um, the term moribund means someone nearing death. And I always consider the Lebanese war survivor to be at, you know, hovering in that space. Um, they exist in their own truth and a reality of their own making. There are no rules in a post-war environment and there are no limitations. And so when they take this form, and, and trust me, this, <laughs> this is not an image that um, I can premeditate. This is an image that just happens. And that's why when I make these <clears throat> moribunds, it takes, um, I've been working on them for uh, about eight years now. and. Um, I can only probably make one or two a year, not because I, um, uh, I don't have time, <laughs> it's because I've, I've been working on them nonstop, but maybe one or two comes out a year. So it's not an easy image to um, exist. Final segment is on redaction. So um, this slide and the next, uh, show us the work of Ariana Bussar-Riffel. And I wanted to really um, discuss her work when it comes to redaction before I, I consider the idea. I mean, when we think of redaction, we always think of those CIA documents, right, where uh, they're blacked out. Uh, they have a bunch of things blacked out. And so uh, in the case of uh, Bussar-Riffel's work, she takes the white supremacist Bible and she cuts out all the words, and she uses the book's doctrine of separating black from white against itself. So she's separating the black words from the white pages, and by doing that, she renders the book useless. And so it's a beautiful, beautiful um, reclaiming of con and, and, and control, basically. And so, uh, so, I want you to consider redaction in two different forms. When we consider redacted texts or images, um, we are considering that we are left with information that was not all of the information, but we are being invited to believe that whatever you're left with is true. The second way, which I find more appealing when we consider um, redaction is redaction as a search. A search for answers, a search for what was, for what not, no longer is, knowing full well that it could all be part of an imagined history. So basically, and, and when we consider memory, for example, um, our memory of things is never 100% accurate, right? And so what was in our imagination could entirely be different from what actually was, right? So, 
So I wanted to show you these images by Elise Fudi, the photographer in um, Beirut after the explosion. Um, Beirut is a redacted city. Historically, it's been destroyed and rebuilt eight times, which is why it has the nickname of the, the city of the Phoenix. Uh, believe me, it's a nickname that we wish we didn't have. Uh, so uh, it's been eight times redacted to be specific, layered, erased, and covered. And so these images that show uh, Beirut under construction and then uh, taken through dilapidated buildings where she is giving us only part of the truth, um, we can see just a different kind of Beirut altogether. And then next slide, please. And next slide. You know, I have to tell you, in case you haven't guessed already, the Lebanese are very blunt with the truth. They just, you know, show it like it is. And so um, in my painting here, you see this, uh, this duality where the city penetrates the living room and the ghost girl exists but doesn't quite. And so always this tension and threat of, of loss, right? Next, please. And so I conclude with um, this current series that I'm working on, uh, which is titled The Living Bones. And um, I know that in Hawaii there's this um, that same connection actually to the importance of the bones more so than um, than how we revere the bones but uh, uh, I've been searching for my grandmother's bones uh, my, my grandmother was buried in Beirut during the war um, not in her ancestral village because uh, it was occupied by the Israelis at the time um, but the cemetery was also destroyed by the Israelis. Um, so um, we don't know where her bones are. And of course, I know we're never going to find the bones, right? But this redaction is something that weighs heavily on me. And so this series questions, where are the bones? Um, and I think that that sits with a lot of Native Hawaiians as well when they ask, where are the bones? Uh, next slide, please. And so um, I invite you to, as you go forth into your creative endeavors, to consider what your own truth is. And just document it fiercely. And um, yeah. So uh, I wanted to thank Creative Mornings and everyone for having me here today. So any questions? <laughs> thank you. Um, that's a great question. Actually, um, no, because uh, growing up in wartime Lebanon, uh, your world is really limited to 100 square meters because, uh, and, and I was super fortunate. Uh, we lived in a house with a big yard. Um, and so I would go outside and just play and play, but um, no access to libraries or, or bookstores or any of that. So um, no, I had very, very limited, uh, it, it was almost like I was discovering the world at 18. Um, post-war Lebanon when I finally went to um, undergrad. So, sure. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, this is something that I, I um, take apart with my students a lot. So uh, sometimes, you know, they want to depict something. I remember a student of mine, um, Hana um, Yoshihata, years ago. Uh, she was painting uh, water and uh, her experience being as part of the Hokulea uh, crew. And so uh, she just wanted to, that's, that's what she was interested in. And I just kept thinking, well, okay, why aren't you using ocean water to, to, to work on, on the surfaces? And that to her was like, what, really, I can do that? And yes, absolutely, you have to um, use what 
what you must. Um, so in my case with the school bus, uh, I used fireworks to um, explode the bus. And so uh, it just makes sense to use gunpowder because why am I trying to depict gunpowder when I can actually use gunpowder? And so that's what I mean by reconciling concept and technique and, and the nece necessity of that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, not really. <laughs> this work is very hard to live with. Um, I don't even have it in my own home. Uh, so when I think of work, uh, you know, and, and the studio and the role of the studio, it's a laboratory. It's where the research happens. And so um, I'm not doing work to sell uh, because uh, that's not really going to happen. Uh, these pieces are gigantic, um, so they're 10 feet. 15 feet, so um, so people don't have room for, for paintings like that. So they are research, and I, I think that it's very important to not jump on the trend bandwagon whenever, you know, they're, they're showing work that's war-related or on Arab artists or, you know, I don't really like those labels, right? Uh, so, um, yeah, I, I, that's a tough one. I mean, there might be, and I don't know about it. Um, I'm not very good at promoting my work, so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm based in Honolulu.